Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. I'm Nick Mance. I'm the president of Southwestern Illinois College. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, faculty, and staff, I am proud to host Governor Pritzker's press conference today, just as we were proud to host a conference for him on his second day in office in 2019. Governor Pritzker is making Southern Illinois, our economy and education, a top priority for his administration. He is here today to talk about House Bill 2170, Education and Workforce Equity Act, an initiative of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, which directly impacts community colleges. Southwestern Illinois College has been educating some of the brightest minds in the region since 1946. We offer more than 150 degrees and certificate programs in arts, sciences, business, health sciences, and technical education. At Southwestern Illinois College, we are always looking forward to the future. Our goal is to be to produce graduates who are prepared for the workforce, so it is essential there are jobs available for our students when they graduate. So that is why we are excited to hear more about Governor Pritzker's plan for education reform in Illinois. Since he's been in office, the governor has put state government back on the side of working families by creating hundreds of thousands of jobs, raising minimum wage to a living wage, making colleges more affordable for nearly 10,000 additional students, and advancing equal pay for women. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Governor J.B. Pritzker. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to President Nick Mance and to SWIC for hosting us this afternoon. It's exciting to be back here. Uh, I'm very proud to be joined today by the Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, by Leader Carol Ammons, by SIU System President Dan Mahoney, and SIU Chancellor Randy Pembroke, Senator Chris Belt, Representative LaToya Greenwood, East St. Louis District 189 Superintendent Arthur Culver, uh, and Bernadette Anderson, Chief Community and Cultural, uh, sorry, Culture Specialist at the Academic Development Institute. Uh, this is a distinguished group of people that stand behind me, sit behind me, and uh, I'm very, very pleased to be with them. Uh, it's really special being back here at SWIC today. Uh, as uh, the president mentioned, two years ago, this was the first place that I visited as governor when I signed an executive order strengthening workforce development funding in growing industries. Despite the many challenges that COVID-19 has visited upon all of us, my commitment to push for more for SWIC and for working families across Illinois hasn't waned one bit. Today, we celebrate taking that promise one step further. The Education and Workforce Equity Act enables significant advancements in K-12 education, in early childhood education, and of course, higher education and workforce development. Our highest return on investment for our state dollars comes when we invest in education and training. And since I took office two years ago, we've made two and four year college more affordable for Illinois families by substantially expanding the monetary assistance program, by expanding access to federal student assistance, the FAFSA uh, application, which some of you saw on my face covering as I came in, and increasing funding for higher education institutions after years of disinvestment and neglect. Equally important are our investments in top-of-the-line apprenticeship and training programs for those who opt to go directly into the workforce, as well as to make sure that those who get additional degrees have great opportunities to put them to good use. 
Working with the General Assembly, my administration has incentivized businesses to provide apprenticeship training through tax credits. We've increased the number of apprenticeships through the Illinois Works Job Program and crafted a nationally recognized plan for strengthening career and technical education. And last fall, I dedicated $15 million to establish two downstate manufacturing training academies that will expand opportunities for skills training, boost retention of manufacturers in downstate communities, and attract more investment by manufacturing companies throughout the state of Illinois. What more can we do to enhance and create education and job opportunities in our state? Well, that's why we're here today. The Education and Workforce Equity Act is a landmark step forward toward economic growth, education, and equity. Thanks to the people standing with me today, local and state leaders in public service and education, committed activists and members of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, and many more who are outside this room, this law supports low-income students so that they can more easily attend a four-year university, it reforms the way that students are placed in community college courses, and expands the Illinois Teaching Excellence Program to attract more diverse and non-traditional candidates to the teaching profession. And by evaluating and streamlining our workforce training initiatives, so, so to make sure that more students might choose a career in education, we're opening more opportunity in communities that have historically been left out and left behind. In addition to addressing affordability, we're making it easier to navigate the college admissions process that has too often left those from under-resourced communities tangled up in the fine print. So I've made simplifying the college application process a key priority of mine as governor. I'm proud to announce that when the common application opens this fall for the 2021-2022 application cycle, Illinois will have all of its public universities join the one-stop shop national application portal, making it that much easier for our students applying to an in-state campus. I've prioritized funding for our schools to participate in the Common App in both of my last two budget proposals, and I look forward to working with the General Assembly again to keep fostering every possible opportunity for our young people to live their dreams, to get the education that they deserve. So thank you, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to someone that I have the pleasure of being partnered with in governance of the state of Illinois, and that's our Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton. Juliana. Good afternoon, everyone. How wonderful it is to be here on the campus of Southwestern Illinois College. To President Mance and the entire city of Belleville, thank you for hosting us and thank you for such a warm welcome. Thank you, Governor Pritzker, for that kind introduction and for your courageous and compassionate leadership throughout what has been a really incredibly challenging year as we faced three interrelated crises, COVID-19, systemic racism, and the economic crisis. Just yesterday, you made the exciting announcement about our path to phase five, thanks to the progress that we are making with equitably administering vaccine doses throughout the state. And all the while, you have never lost sight of the need to address the historical inequities that we see in too many black, brown, and indigenous communities. Today, we lift up the incredible work of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus and your signing of the Education and Workforce Equity Act, which will bring justice, equity, and opportunity to so many. And let me just say that today's announcement of the common application is a game changer. To my friends and former colleagues of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, I am so proud of you. State Representative LaToya Greenwood and State Senator Chris Belt, thank you for your hard work and powerful advocacy for communities in the Metro East region. These reform pillars will change lives for generations to come. And I especially want to acknowledge Leader Carol Ammons, as well as Senate Majority Leader Kimberly Lightford in her absence. I see both of you in the spirit of Shirley Chisholm, 
never standing on the sidelines, and bringing your whole selves into rooms and spaces where decisions are being made. I know you worked, and I know you cried, and I know that you believe in our children. To East St. Louis District 189, Superintendent Culver, and the other special guests in attendance today that have been acknowledged, thank you for your advocacy and leadership. So, President Mats and President Mahoney and Chancellor Pembroke, they'll appreciate that today is the last day of Rock the FAFSA Week. And before I begin my brief remarks, I want to highlight the importance of FAFSA and the application and encourage every high school senior to complete the FAFSA. We all know that graduating from college can, be, can change the trajectory of students in our most marginalized communities. But we also know that attending a college or university is an investment that many black, brown, indigenous, and rural students simply cannot afford. FAFSA is the key to financial aid and all state financial aid, both at the federal and state level, rather, uh, including MAP grants and programs like the Minority Teachers of Illinois Scholarship. If you have not done so, please encourage all high school seniors that you know to complete the FAFSA application today. Now, in honor of Women's History Month, I'd like to begin with a quote from Marion Wright Edelman, who said that education is for improving the lives of others and for leaving your community and your world better than you found it. For women and girls, this is especially true because far too often we are undervalued and overlooked and undereducated. The Education and Workforce Equity Act will positively impact all children, but I'm especially excited about what it will do for black and brown girls from marginalized communities, girls that are often increasingly pushed out of school who often face the harshest discipline and who rarely have access to the resources to address their trauma. You see, at best, education opens doors and gives children an engine that drives their dreams. And in marginalized communities, especially for girls, it shapes our confidence. Teachers are often the first to tell them that they are creative, that they are smart, and that they can go anywhere that their hearts talent and hard work can take them. For me, it was Miss Williams in the sixth grade who made me feel like I could conquer the world. We have to be able to count on education to be its best for every child in every zip code, in every schoolhouse, in every county in the state of Illinois, and that's why we are here today. This legislation is a difference maker. And Governor Pritzker already mentioned how it will help increase diversity of our teachers all throughout the state. And why is this important? Because there's an old saying that you can't be what you can't see. And we know that students who learn from teachers who look like them develop better social skills and have better academic outcomes. And actually, research shows that having diverse teachers improves academic outcomes for all students. So. This legislation makes education in Illinois stronger and more inclusive, and when we learn, we grow. When we grow, we achieve, and when we achieve, we all rise. And when we rise, we do what Marion Wright Edelman said, we leave our community and our world better than we found it. It is now my honor to introduce one of the architects of this legislation, and she is a champion for all children, Leader Carol Ammons. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for welcoming us here at Southwestern Illinois College. Uh, I was a former um, chair of higher education, and so it is my pleasure to be here visiting you uh, this afternoon. It is also my pleasure to be here because my roots are in the dirt around this area. My family is from East St. Louis. My father is here in Belleville, which I'll visit him today. And uh, all of my family is between um, the Mississippi River, so I'm honored to be here this afternoon. I'm also honored to be here with my colleague, Latoya Greenwood, and Senator Belt of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, 
and my former seatmate, uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, and uh, certainly my governor, JB. Uh, I'm happy to always be with him because he is really a true warrior for all of the things that we all care about. And I would be remiss if I did not recognize Superintendent Culver, who was also our superintendent at one point in Champaign Unit 4 schools. So I have a lot of connection in this area, and so I'm very happy to be here this afternoon. I also want to acknowledge the president of this institution. Um, when we came in, people were very, very warm. And that always tells us a little bit about the administration when you come to an institution and how they welcome you uh, when you get there. So my hat off to you uh, for the great work that you all are putting as an example at this institution. In 1979, Toni Morrison gave a commencement address at Bernard College of Columbia University in New York City. And in the absence of leader Lightford, who is not able to be with us today, it really, really made me think about this and made me think about her. She led the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus as our joint chair. And after the killing of George Floyd, all of us who just really reamed from that horrible incident decided that we were going to get together and try to make change. And that change was, yes, focused in one area of the criminal justice system. But we knew that all of these things could be addressed if we could address the fundamental issue that we believe drives a lot of what we experience in our communities. And that's the lack of access to education and the improvement of that access. And so she and I got together, and we all worked together as a caucus to establish four pillars. One of those pillars is the education pillar for which I was um, the chief sponsor in the House on. That speech that was done by Toni Morrison at uh, Columbia University at New York City, that speech was entitled Cinderella's Stepsisters. And often black people in the community really kind of feel like stepsisters and brothers in the larger scheme of things. And that quote that was done by Toni Morrison, she ended the speech with this quote. The function of freedom is to free someone else. Education is the most basic and most powerful manifestation of that freedom that we'll ever have. For centuries, African Americans were left out of educational opportunities, and in some cases, it would cost them their lives to even get it. But we have moved a long way from that point. But we haven't dealt considerably with the cost of achieving education at its highest levels. We in the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus decided that we would make this a priority. That is why House Bill 2170 was so important, because it helps us break down the barriers that were historically made difficult for black students and difficult for black communities to advance. HB 2170 mandates that students are automatically enrolled for advanced courses when they make the grades to qualify for them. So we're not giving them anything. We're removing the barriers to advanced coursework on the front door. History, textbooks today, were littered with misinformation that misinformed many of our students about our country's origins, about the development of our economic system, about how we value human life, and so much more. Our education systems have fed through revisionist history stories that do not bring about inclusive histories or inclusive activities. That is the reason why we included in this legislation the Inclusive American History Commission. That commission, which the governor will populate, will really look at how we can change our history and social sciences to be more inclusive, to get the facts right, and to make sure students are listening and learning from each other as different ethnicities and cultures will allow. The ripple effect of holding black students back has led to the racial wealth gap, redlining, employment inequality, wage inequality, healthcare inequality, and environmental injustices that we see COVID has revealed to the entire world. So we created a whole child task force to make sure that we have access to education for the child from birth all the way to workforce development. This task force will help us develop standards 
for which we did not have before, and how to treat mental, emotional, and social welfare of our children, including children who experience trauma in their lives. So many young children will never, ever experience a black teacher prior to the signing of this bill. But this bill has included, by the governor's signature, the Illinois Teaching Ex Excellence Program. That provision was designed to increase racially and ethnically diverse candidates that will go through the National Board Certification. Why is that important? Because when I saw Dr. Culver, I said to my son, hey, you could be the superintendent of schools. That was an important thing for him to know and that he had a way to get there. And through this program, students just like him will be able to advance their careers in such a way that will lend back to other children. They say that you can't be what you can't see. We're changing that. We shared our experiences with each other walking through higher education, and we decided that we would make this a priority. When the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus started to construct 2170, we decided to zoom out to look at every piece of our educational system, from early childhood development to workforce development. There are more than 30 significant provisions that are encompassed in this legislation, in this public act. Let me correct that. Because when we work on it, it's legislation. When the governor signs it, it's a public act. There are more than 30 significant provisions in this public act that will change the trajectory of the lives of many of our students in Illinois. We knew that just fixing one part of higher education or one portion of K through 12 was not going to cut it. If the system was going to be uh, built and rebuilt to help all of our students, we needed to reimagine it. Education is the most powerful tool that we have. And in order to manifest that future and that freedom, we thought it was incumbent upon the state legislature to take this provision up. That quote that I read to you earlier about Toni Morrison, well, the substance of that quote was really about allowing people to flourish and grow to experience their own power, and to do that with the access of a liberal education and the pursuit of the arts and the sciences. That is how we change communities. The function of a 21st century educational system must produce humane human beings, people who care about other people. So for us, we're excited to stand with you all today to look at how we will reshape education for the generations to come. And what our communities can become will de be determined based on the amount of education they're able to receive. We have a lot more work to do. As the governor just expressed, we've worked through the issue of applications and accessing community colleges and four-year institutions through the common application process. That will help families navigate the system much easier, and yes, with the FAFSA that we did a couple of sessions ago, we are going to increase the number of students who some of them may believe they just can't afford to go. But the FAFSA helps the families get that, uh, that financial burden behind them, and that is one way that we will continue to move education towards an educational freedom that all of our students are entitled to. So with that, I am honored to introduce Senator Belt, who is no stranger to you all. But for us, he is an educator, he is a policymaker, he is a leader in the Senate, and certainly he is a leader in the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus. Thank you so much for welcoming us, Senator Belt. Good afternoon. I am not going to be long. I have three things I want to talk about and go over with protocol already being established. Uh, first thing I want to do, though, is, is touch upon something the Lieutenant Governor and Leader Ammons has already alluded to, and that's to the Governor. Governor, it, it, it takes courage. We've done our part and then the bill goes to you, and then you have to sign it. As, as Leader Ammon said, it becomes a public act when, when that happens. But from the transition from the General Assembly to the governor, we're, we're, we, we miss 
the courage part. And that was brought up today. He has to sign it. He doesn't have to, but he chose to. And that takes courage and that takes leadership. Now, I don't know if the situation creates leaders or leaders are born. That's the chicken or the egg, right? But what I do know is you can check all those boxes. You are a leader. And you are a leader that we needed for these times. It's already been laid out that we, we have a uh, public health issue. We have economic issues. We have racial strife. And we needed a transformational leader to guide us through this. And sir, we have you, so thank you. To the legislation. Illinois has a promise and, and has made us a promise. In, in, in Article 10, Section 1 of the Illinois State Constitution, it reads, a fundamental goal of the people of the state of Illinois is the educational development of all, and I underscore all persons, to the limits of their capacity. The state shall provide an efficient system of high, and I underscore quality, public educational institutions and services. Education in public schools through the secondary level shall be, and I underscore, free. There may be such other free uh, education as the General Assembly provides by law. I need you to get this last point. The state has the primary responsibility for financing the system of public education. Doesn't say anything about your zip code. Doesn't say anything about where you live. It says the state Article 10, Section 1 says it's the state's responsibility to provide a quality, efficient, high quality, efficient education and to finance it. And, and, and this bill and the signing of this bill gets us closer to Illinois' promise to all of her students. We are governed by our Constitution. Whether spoken words or written words, words matter. There's consequences to words. And so this promise must be kept. And so we intend to do it. We intend to make sure that we get there to the authors of this legislation. Leaders Leifert and Leaders Ammons. I've seen your passion. I know your commitment. I've, I've seen you both cry as, as through working groups over this long, arduous task, this journey. And I just want to thank you for your commitment. It, it's not easy, right? It's never easy. But, but, but you trade off convenience for conscience. And I thank you for what you've done. Of all the things, three things, two more things, of all the things the authors put in this bill, House Bill 2170. That's now law. I am most enthused and excited about the attention and initiative given to early childhood intervention and education. Consider Article 10. It allows children to continue to access early intervention services until beginning of school year after they turn three. Or Article 5, which codifies the kindergarten readiness assessment or finally, Article 35, which urges the state to increase the availability of infant slash early childhood mental health consultation. Now, here's the thing, guys. Science confirms that the first five years of life are particularly important for the development of a child's brain. We know this. And, it, and then furthermore, science says that within the first three years of a child's life, that's the most critical in shaping the brain's architecture. Leaders, Ammons and Lifer, thank you for creating legislation that focuses on those early years. Why, why we don't do it is, is beyond me. Why we haven't done it is beyond me. The science tells you right here what we need to do. And so as legislators, it behooves us to follow the science. How can we, how can you learn as a child 
when you're suffering from social emotional issues. Buzzword in education, social emotional learning, social emotional learning. But how can you learn if you're affected by trauma? And believe it, you, you early young kids are affected by trauma just as much as older kids. Older kids have the ability to articulate and say something is wrong. Younger kids just tell you, I got a headache, my stomach's hurting, and I'm fidgety, and they're fidgety. But they're suffering from trauma. We have to focus on their social emotional learning, their mental health. The great orator, Frederick Douglass, put it this way. He said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Now, I'll expand the base in broken men, broken women, broken. It's easier to fix it earlier than to deal with it later. Because at some point, you're going to deal with it. And it's better to invest in our babies while they're, early, while they're learning and while the science says this is the time to get them. So thank you. Last point. Growing up in Centerville, I grew up in Centerville. I was born in East St. Louis, raised in Centerville. And so every day at the conclusion of the, the, the school day, my friends and I, we would walk home from school. And from time to time, we would meet this uh, older gentleman, and his name was Mr. Goss. We, we, we were probably third, fourth grade, but I remember it as if it was just yesterday. I remember those times. And, and whenever we would approach him, no matter how many times we, we would see him, he would always say this phrase, everybody is somebody. Everybody is somebody. And when he would say it, we would smile, and inevitably it would just raise us up, make us feel better. Now, expand that out, translate that over to an all-inclusive American history curriculum. That, that, that focuses on everybody, that essentially tells students, no matter ethnicity, no matter race, no matter sexual orientation, no matter gender identification, that essentially tells students what Mr. Goss told us. Everybody is somebody, and you matter. Your story matters. Think about that. No longer will we exclude anybody. History will be told from an inclusive state. Your story will be told. You matter. That's what matters. And when you matter, you'll feel better. There's a euphoric feeling that came over us. We felt like we could do anything, and those students will feel the same way. Let, engage them in the story. Engage them in the narrative. And I guarantee you their grades will be better because now they can see themselves. It matters. It matters. That being said, I want to bring up to the stage at this point uh, Representative Greenwood. She's the representative for the 114th district. She fights, she advocates for a district, and she does an outstanding job in the General Assembly. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Pritzker, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, President Mance, Superintendent Culver, Leader Carol Ammons, Senator Belt, and our other guests present today. I was reviewing my notes and the many emails and correspondence that we had as a caucus in preparing for this moment. It is hard to determine which pillar is the most important, the most urgent. Is it health care? Is it education? Is it criminal justice? Is it economic empowerment? They all are critical to our communities. Each has played a significant role in placing all of us closer to equity, justice, and accountability of enormous proportions throughout our state. I read the remarks from the chief sponsor of the Education and Workforce Equity Act, Senator Kimberly Lightford, on the day that our governor signed this historic legislation into law. 
Leader Leifer stated that every statistic, every metric, every measure that's compiled, counted, analyzed, and audited tells you as a black mother that your baby has a small chance of ever becoming a successful adult. Simply because they were born black in a system built to ensure their failure. This has been the story of so many families in this state. Dreams deferred. And so today it is an honor to stand alongside my colleagues as we take this meaningful step forward to ensure children who look like me have a more accessible pathway to a brighter future. The education pillar, the Education and Workforce Equity Act of the Black Caucus agenda is about bringing lasting equity, fairness, and justice to the education system. I want to thank Leader Kimberly Leifer and Leader Carol Ammons and Governor Pritzker for their collaborative leadership, which has enabled us to begin maximizing educational outcomes for vulnerable communities of color. Thank you, and it is my absolute honor to introduce Superintendent Arthur Culver, Culver, who has been an educational leader in our area, and we are very excited to hear what he has to say this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Representative Greenwood. And I would be remiss if I didn't just take this opportunity right now to thank the entire Illinois Legislative Black Caucus for having the courage and the foresight to champion House Bill 2170 that we call the Education and Workforce Equity Act. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Trust me, that was not an easy task at all. It took a lot of collaboration, a lot of tears, a lot of hard work. And also must thank our esteemed Governor J.B. Prisker for having the courage, as was mentioned earlier, to sign such a bill. I know because I have friends in Springfield, it was not easy, it was very controversial. And many did not want this bill at all, and certainly did not want it to be signed by our governor. This bill contains major education reform legislation that is designed to address systemic issues that have caused deep inequities and educational gaps in our state, in our state for decades. This law takes powerful steps forward to ensure that all students have access to a rigorous learning experience and opportunities that will definitely prepare them to succeed in college, the workforce, and life. We've never had anything like this before. I want to take just a brief moment to review a few of the significant things as it relates to K-12 education. Let's start with early childhood. It was mentioned by some earlier, but it really does uh, something that's huge, at least for those that live in East St. Louis. It expands the access to early childhood intervention programs by allowing students who turn three between the ages, between May and August, to immediately start receiving services instead of waiting four or five months until the beginning of the next school year. That's time lost that our students certainly cannot afford to lose. Every moment counts. It also requires the Illinois State Board of Education to annually assess all public school students, kindergarten students, by using a kindergarten readiness assessment tool to measure readiness for kindergarten. Because many of our students come to school behind. And if we try to start all of them off in the same place when they're at different spots, then we're not meeting their educational needs. So what this does, it allows educators 
to really create independent educational plans for all students as soon as they hit kindergarten. It also, and very importantly, requires behavioral health providers to begin using a set of diagnostic and prescript prescriptive methods that are developmentally age appropriate for students that are under the age of five. And that's critical because in East St. Louis, many of our students come to us having experienced a lot of adverse childhood experiences. If they're not ready for education, they're dealing with so many social, emotional, and behavior issues. And we need to deal with that before we can even begin the teaching and learning process, or at least alongside as we start the teaching and learning process. Rigorous coursework for students in high school and, and below high school, that's really important. What this law does, it requires that when students enter the ninth grade, that they will have a whole year of intensive instruction in computer literacy. That means a lot because, as you know, in communities that are challenged with resources, a lot of times they don't have that computer, the computer literacy skills that they need to compete with their counterparts. Students entering ninth grade also must complete a year, a full year, of laboratory science instead of general science. In your rich school districts, they start laboratory science in ninth grade, in some, many times below ninth grade, in eighth grade, seventh grade. But in poor school districts, sometimes they take general science in ninth grade, and they don't get a chance to have lab experiences until their 11th or 12th grade year. Another thing that's important is foreign language. This law requires that every high school student will have two years of foreign language. It also increases access to high-level courses and advanced placement, such as advanced placement courses, honors classes, enrichment opportunities, and things of that nature if students meet the state assessment criteria. If they meet or exceed standards on the state assessment, then they automatically have access to those upper level courses. In some districts, I know when I was in Champaign, I, I discovered that when you go into those advanced classes, the, the classes, they weren't diverse. They weren't. And that's because even though some of the African American students met the guidelines, they had these gatekeeper things in place where there had to be a recommendation from a teacher or an in-district assessment, even though students may have met and exceeded criteria on state assessments. What this law does, it automatically gives students the right to take those courses and not be held back by gatekeeper criteria, such as a teacher recommendation or an in-district assessment or local assessment. It also, as was mentioned earlier, expands the um, understanding of black history by requiring that history, when it's taught, black history must include pre-enslavement area, in other words, era rather, so that folks can understand the history of black people before they were enslaved and understand why and how they became enslaved and also get a better understanding of the American Civil Rights Renaissance era. So when people understand other races, what that does, in my opinion, it increases the knowledge, the understanding, which also, when there's knowledge and understanding, it sometimes increases the respect. So when other races understand and have knowledge about all races, then that, I think, creates more racial harmony. The one other thing that it does, it requires the Illinois P20 Council to make recommendations for short-term and long-term effects of, COVID, of the COVID pandemic. That's really critical because COVID hit all of our communities hard, but I think low-income communities were hit harder, and the impact of COVID is probably going to be longer in your lower-income uh, communities. So I'm glad that that bill requires that we look at short-term and long-term impacts of COVID. Professional review panel now, because of this law, is going to be strengthened 
because the evidence-based funding formula, this bill requires the panel to have the power to look at the funding formula and see how it needs to be changed so that poor communities can get the financial resources that they need. It also creates a whole child task force to focus on expanding the trauma responsive services that are needed to help kids strengthen their social and emotional development. And that's critical in areas where children experience a lot of adverse childhood experiences while they're at school and certainly before becoming to school too. One other area that I want to hit before I sit down is teacher diversity. That's important for kids to see teachers that look like them. And it's going to strengthen the teacher pipeline because it's going to make it more diverse. It's also going to increase the scholarship amount for the Minority Teachers of Illinois initiative. One thing that I'm really proud of is that it's going to prioritize black males, which is important because when you look at the low number of black male teachers in this profession, not just in Illinois, but all over the country, it's, uh, it's alarming. And also, I think that's one of the reasons why there's such an alarming disparity between the academic achievement that currently exists between black male students and other students. So what it's going to do with the alternative licensure program, it's going to eliminate that need to have a 3.0 grade point average before you can enter an alternative certification program. And I think that will create more black male teachers in our state. One other thing that I think is going to be critical is that this bill does um, have the creation of what we call freedom schools. We have those in Champaign, Illinois. But what freedom schools are, it's the, it's the after school and summer enrichment programs that will supplement the traditional educational program by focusing on expanding the uh, knowledge and teaching of black history. Focuses, it focuses on developing leadership skills for our African American students. And it also uh, creates a better understanding of the civil rights movement so that people can understand the history of the black experience across this nation. Achieving equity will mean doing things a lot different. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. These changes will cause more students to have access to a high quality education. It will cause them to have better self-esteem, to believe in themselves. It will help them get accepted into colleges and universities and have careers that will allow them to support a family. Our students will have the skills and the confidence to have high expectations early on in life, to see themselves as achievers, to set high goals, to persevere through adversity, and to understand that regardless of what they're going through right now, that they were born to win, engineers for success, and endowed with the seeds of greatness. I want to again thank the Black Caucus and especially thank Governor Pritzker for supporting these efforts. And at this time, I'd like to call back up Governor Prisker to answer questions and, and perhaps have additional comments. Thank you. Thank you, the superintendent. Happy to take questions from members of the media. Sorry, I'm going to move a little closer to you so I can hear you. Thank you. Um, so I think the, if I can wrap it all into one, uh, uh, with the short and long term potential effects on learning that COVID has had, um, what will it take for us to address that? 
some of the things that are in this bill. Yep. So I think there are a couple of things I, I would say. And we've, we've been working very closely through ISBE with local school districts to try to help them through what will need to take place in their districts for their kids um, to make up for the learning loss that may have taken place over the last year. Um, some have experienced more learning loss than others, uh, potentially because they didn't have the opportunity to be in school, in class for much of that time, uh, or you know had more kids who were in remote learning than, than usual. Um, I would just say with that, this is gonna take a comprehensive effort. We're encouraging schools to think about summer as a time when they could uh, you know, have those kids still in class and expand their learning opportunity in class. More kids are going back into the classroom now because we have vaccinated so many teachers, because we have prepared the schools. There's been a lot of funding that's been made available to schools to make it safer. We've uh, reduced the social distancing that's required in schools when they're in class from six feet to three feet. Uh, so that you can get more kids into a classroom. So there's a lot that's going on. This is a dynamic effort. I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all uh, situation. The good news is that the federal government recognized this and provided significant amounts of education funding, not just in the past bills that, that, were, uh, uh, that were signed in uh, 2020, but in this stimulus bill most recently signed, significant billions of dollars coming to the state of Illinois. Uh, that's going directly to our schools. Um, with regard to the, the uh, uh, important uh, parts of the, this bill, uh, we need to make sure that we're funding education properly in the state of Illinois. I've said that for some time now. We are in a difficult moment from a budget perspective. This is a pandemic budget that we're dealing with. There's no doubt that I think, certainly I can speak for myself when I say uh, that I would like to see more funding for education we are in the situation of having to balance the budget. Uh, we don't have uh, new money coming in to the state for the state budget. Uh, and so, you know, we've had to ask for sacrifices, uh, f you know, the corporate welfare that's been, uh, you know, in our uh, budgets for years and years and years. We've asked large corporations, you know, it's time for them to give up some of the corporate welfare so that we can provide the kind of funding that's necessary for things like what's in this bill. Uh, but there's more that we need to do, there's no doubt. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that not just this year, but for many years to come, that we will focus on education funding as a primary focus of budgets. Yes. It would start when 70% uh, of those who are 65 and over have been vaccinated. And we're to, we, as of today, we're over 60%. Um, I'm not sure if it's 61 or 62 now, but we're close. And then when we get to 70, we would begin the bridge phase. Okay, so on that day, that's when it would automatically kick off the 28 days. Yes, or perhaps the next day. I can't, I can't remember right now if there's 24 hours between the time it happens or not, but yes. Very close to that moment. And then, what are your thoughts on the uh, House's decision to uh, condemn a vote on the they approved the resolution to condemn uh, Speaker Pelosi's vote for January Well, I think you know that I uh, was very much involved uh, in before I became governor in uh, fighting for civil rights in in. Uh, helping to build a Holocaust museum to teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust about fighting bigotry and hatred uh, and intolerance. And I think you heard some remarks from the representative that are in that category of uh, hatred and intolerance. And uh, so I think it was appropriate for the House of Representatives to, um, you know, to pass that resolution. Uh, I do not think that people who espouse those views, uh, you know, are people that um, the public, you know, should want to have representing them, frankly. Um, I have, uh, you know, had my own interactions with the representative. 
Um, I think he is um, somebody who uh, carries those views with him everywhere he goes. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that uh, I think a resolution that passed, even though it was the right thing to do, I, my guess is he will not have a positive response to it and, and mend his ways. Oh, gosh, we had many, many people from Southern Illinois that were involved in developing those plans. I think it's just the partisans that you're talking about, the Republicans in the legislature who uh, are saying they would like to be part of the, the, they are not the only people in the state. We were talking to people who run industry in the state to make sure that we're, as we're thinking about reopening the state, we're being responsive to the needs of small businesses that were rehiring people across the state, uh, that we're doing this in a way that will keep people safe and healthy while we're reopening the economy. They are not experts, with all due respect, uh, and yet we used our experts, the doctors that are at the Department of Public Health, uh, you know, as well as experts in uh, the economy, uh, to uh, gather and speak with those uh, industry experts in order to come up with uh, reopening plans, but um, but but let me be clear that the legislature, the legislators who have complained about um, not being involved in one decision or another, they have the ability to um, introduce a bill in the legislature and to convince their colleagues to vote for that bill. Um, and so I, I'm happy to take input. I have all along. You can ask some of those Republicans if they tell you the truth. Uh, they know that I have reached out to many of them throughout the last year to ask their opinion about how best do we bring ba people back, uh, for example, to church. Um, you remember early on, we didn't know what the spreading um, uh, was going to be like for people going into church, and so we closed church. But then we, uh, we wanted to make sure we were reopening church in a safe way, and so I called many of downstate Republicans and asked them uh, who live in communities where people are um, in particular, you know, uh, many of the people in their communities go to church every Sunday. And uh, so I wanted to hear from them, and I did, and I incorporated their ideas into uh, the reopening plans. And that goes for, you know, for lots of other topics. I could tell you about state parks, fishing. You know, we had to make a lot of rules in order to um, keep people safe and healthy, but we also wanted to make sure we got input. And when the legislature didn't meet for almost a year, um, you know, those, those decisions were left to me, and of course it's a pandemic and an emergency, and, and since I had the power to, uh, to help keep people safe, I did that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.